Well, good morning, guys, and welcome to the show, Brando. Welcome to the show. Do you like the way we start these? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, we're doing it. I feel like it's just kind of second nature now. Uh, what yeah. do you want to say? I know. Ladies and gentlemen. All right, stop. Please. Today we have a Toyota... Tundra. Thank you. That we're going to be putting in... I guess you'd call it what? Like the everyday system? The average system? The normal system? The daily system? The daily system. And well, we thought we'd take you on this journey as we walk you through it. The install, that is. So, let's get started, shall we? mentioned how much I absolutely hate dog hair makes me sneeze makes my eyes water before we start on the car it should look like this not like that it's working overtime today so the next car comes like this it's gonna be an extra charge of three hundred dollars <laughs> <laughs> come on guys Seriously. So this is a 2012 Tundra, which is about, you know, the year. This is these are still on the road. This is still an awesome truck. There's still a lot of these around. And well, you know, it's it's time to finally upgrade it and make it sound better and also give it the much needed improvement in the dash. I mean, CD player, who what are those? And no screen. There is a backup camera in the mirror, I believe. Either way, it's it's very Nothing. I mean, the car has Bluetooth, which for a lot of time, that was the coolest thing in the world. But we've moved past that now, haven't we all? We can agree on that. And well, it's time to get with the now. And so the now is something with wireless Android Auto or Apple CarPlay and USB-C and being able to get your maps and all that other fun stuff into the radio, which we're gonna do today. And we're gonna be doing that with a Kenwood DMX 908S. We're gonna be putting some of the Exelon 6902Cs in along with the X74 for the rear we're going to be powering some of this we'll get to that with the xr 401.4 we're going to be using the rockford p301 8 inch this thing's pretty cool it's ported it's got 300 watts we'll explain why we chose that along with a bunch of parts and bobbles and things and yeah a bunch of stuff like that to bring this car into well, just to rocket it into the future as far as the technologies that's in here right now, we're going to retain all the steering wheel control functions and stuff like that, the push to talk that's on there via iData. The key is, where do we get started, right? Shouldn't that be the, 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 the point of this? Cleaning the car. We did have to clean the car because it was less than desirable and it makes me sneeze and I didn't want to sneeze. So last night we got the car in and we spent a bunch of time vacuuming it out so that today it would be calmed down. All the dust that's in the car would be not there so I could come in and not have to take six Zyrtex. But aside from that, this has no other stereo equipment in it. It's a, it's a virgin car, which is great. Mm -hmm. So we get to run through our normal battery of things we like to do. And that is get the radio out of the dash, get the hood up, figure out what side of the car the power wire needs to go down and just basically come up with an idea of where stuff is going to go. Yeah, right? yeah. 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 All right. Let's head into the car and get the radio out. <laughs> to start this whole process, that involves removing this cup holder here, which if you start on the passenger side, put your fingers in and just kind of pull up, the whole thing will come out. There is a plastic Phillips head really annoying screw located right here gotta go slow don't use a drill because it'll just spin we like to use these rubber totes like this to put all our screws and bobbles in remove the gear shifter unlock cover shift it back just lift forward one clip that needs to be done and just kind of turn it sideways and it'll come right out. The next step is a combination of the cigarette lighter slash air conditioner. To do that, just kind of pull up on the dash side of things. And then in the hole that you've created, just 
kind of pull. The cigarette lighter should pop off first. These are gonna be annoying, but should easily come out. And then put your hand underneath the dash where these knockouts are. Just kind of wiggle a little bit, left and right. Just a couple clips and that's it. And the whole thing should turn and come out. There's a bunch of plugs on this, but most of them actually don't go to anything. And then in this case, one of the clips got stuck in the radio. These little yellow guys here. Anytime a clip comes out, I like to pull it out and put it back where it goes, as opposed to doing it later, because Fernando might be the one putting this back in, and he's not gonna know that the clip fell out. To get the radio out, there's four 10 millimeters located on the bottom. Two of them are here in the front, and then two are located deep in the back. Grab it from the bottom corner and just kind of it's one of those things you kind of got to push at the top as you're pulling it out there's three clips across the top you just don't want to lean up into the dash too much it comes out of the dash pretty far and that's it the radio is out of the dash now if you're doing one of these that has a premium audio there might be a speaker located up in here that you can remove it's a great place to put the gps antenna it's also a good place when you're putting the radio in if you're doing like a, a double din that is a long chassis this wiring is on the top of the dash here and that's why it has this tubing over it sometimes to save space, we'll actually pull the tubing off and wrap each one of these up individually. But what's nice is you can put your hand in here and hold the wiring and pull it back as you're putting in the deeper radios because there is room back here, but it's it's kind of hard and tucked up and funny to get to. Now, if we take a look at this big cavity here that we've created, this is gigantic. This is as deep as the cup holder, so you have a good two inches underneath here. You have all this area up in here. This is great if you have to do passive crossovers or something like that. They can all fit up inside of here. We've done a ton of them where we put multiple passives in here. Sometimes if you're doing small brick amplifiers, you can tuck those up in here. The amplifier we're doing, we could probably fit in this area. I don't think I'm going to, let's just say that. I don't know, we'll see. But there is a lot of room up in here to put things, which is kind of nice. So join me over on the bench and we'll take a look at the kit, the radio that we're putting in, the harnesses that we need and all that other fun stuff. When you go to replace the radio in this Toyota Tundra, they ran this body style for a while. And the big difference between the older ones and the newer ones was the color of the dash. There's two colors. There's this color here, which even though it looks very black, is gray. And then there's the first color they had, which is the dark black, like a piano black finish. So make sure when getting the kit, you get the kit that corresponds to the color that you're using. So the gray is clearly not black. The black matches this screen here. The kit we're using, is the T-O-Y-K-967-M-G. G stands for gray. Inside of this kit is a bunch of bubble wrap, and the reason why there is a bunch of bubble wrap is because they don't want to scratch that really nice gray paint job they did to make it look like the factory. What that means is that when you're bored at lunchtime, you get to, you know, do this for a couple hours. How fun is that? Inside of the bubble wrap, it's in another bag. And that pulls off, and there you have that nice gray finish, which is really nice. Now, I like to keep my bubble wrap, and that's what I'm gonna set it in on my workbench because I'm not ready for it yet. There is also a bag for the trim. This is painted as well, and this is designed to sit inside of this. And then there's a pocket also. And in the patch, you'd say, who's gonna put a double din in this car? Why do I need a pocket? And I would've been right there with you, but now with floating screens, a lot of them have single din back chassis, so the pocket has become important again. I like to open the pockets just because sometimes manufacturers do stick stuff like parts and stuff like that in the pockets. In this case, they didn't. We don't need this stuff move it into the proper filing cabinet. To go with that pocket, there is also a single DIN trim ring, and then it is painted as well. They put the brackets in bubble wrap so that they don't scratch anything. There's a left and right bracket, and if you'll look here, you'll see those two screw provisions. One is towards the front here, and then one is in the back, just like the factory radio. And it does have this piece on it. This is for the pocket. The pocket gets broken off because we're not gonna use it, and it's a simple to remove piece. There you go. There's also these two spacers here that are going to go into the side. If you kind of look close, you can see that little stair step there. That is for a single DIN chassis. Typically, it's a little wider, and these won't be used for that. Inside, 
this little bag here, are some screws and some clips. It comes with a bunch of screws that are used to attach a radio that uses a coarse head screw, one of these guys here, to the bracket. If your radio is like a Kenwood or JVC, some Alpines, they don't use coarse head screws, they use fine thread screws, which will be in our box for the Kenwood. Don't try to screw these in because all you do is cross thread it and screws up the radio. But what you do need are these two metal clips right here, and these are gonna attach to this corner here and this corner here. And these are what gonna lock the top into place. To prep this kit, I take my flush cutters, I go over to this bar, this bar is in here for the pocket. We're not gonna need that. Cut it with the flush cutters and removes it. Next, carefully slide in your front trim. It should snap into place. There's four little clips for it to clip into here and here. And then these are designed to clip in. There's four little pegs, two in each corner. And then there's little teeth on the kit that you can see. And these are all designed to kind of snap into place. Go slow, because you don't want to break them. And then they'll, they'll lock in and hold just like that. And then these have a little nipple that sticks out of them as well and there's a hole on here for them to go into those will slide into place the problem with these is that they, they they rock back and forth and they don't like to stay put if you want to put some glue or some double-sided tape or something like that on there you can sometimes when I'm frustrated I will do that there is the the basics of my kit seat just fell off. The DMX 908S is the radio we're going to go with here. It is chock full of features like wireless Android, Apple CarPlay, HDMI. If you have Android, it will do wireless mirroring of some kind. It has the HDMI micro input if you want to do something from an iPhone. There again, it's limited on what it can do because Apple's locking a lot of that down. It is USB-C, short body, and an iData link compatible radio, which is awesome. Awesome. Let's get this thing out. Inside the box, it comes with more bubble wrap. You guys will have just lots of fun if you have kids, hand it off to them. There's nothing in this particular piece of bubble wrap. The microphone for wireless talking. There is a USB-C to regular USB adapter. The fine thread screws that we're gonna need to screw this in. The USB-C extension, the main harness, the GPS antenna, and a trim bracket that you're not gonna need for 99% of your installs. A owner's manual, and the radio itself. Now the reason why it comes with that trim bracket is because it actually still comes with a cage. It's one of the only radios that still does. If you need a radio with a cage, like you're doing some kind of center council mount or something like that, Kenwood is the, your go-to radio. And this is what it means to be a short chassis radio. Most radios come out about here. This one does not. Let's take a look at the back of the radio. On the back of this radio, you see these two little dark U areas. There's a Phillips screw right here. And you remove that, that'll get you to your USB-C and your micro HDMI. It's designed to lock them in to place. Kenwood does make a cable for their HDMI if you want an automated grade version of it. Dash cam plugs in here. Microphone plugs in there. Sirius XM. These two connectors are for the iData connection. GPS antenna. So they've they've made this nice little area right here. It's all laid out really nice. It's not random throughout the radio. It's kind of cool. The FM antenna is on a pigtail, which is great. And then they've split our RCAs. It's a very clean back of the radio. It's a very very pleasing the way they've done this. Kenwood always goes rear, front, sub, and this is no different. This is made to stay on there. It's just a little cover. There's nothing functional behind it. They just did that because there are five yellow connectors here. The top one here is for camera number three, then reverse cam, and then front cam. Video out, video in, AV in. AV in can be used for a bunch of different things. You can do a fourth camera through AV input, or you can just run anything AV into this. 15 amp fuse and then the plug plugs in here. The fan and heat sink are all off to the side which is nice as opposed to in the middle where they've always put them in the past. On the front it looks like pretty much every Kenwood that has come out in the last a long time. Volume up and down, mute, home button, menu, source feature, and then camera button. And some of these are multi-function buttons. But look how shallow that is. That's a good and a bad thing. The good thing is is 
well, it's shorts. So it's gonna make it go into the dash. The bad thing is, is a lot of these dash kits are made for longer radios. And when you put them in, you're not gonna get all the screw provisions that you're used to. You're only gonna get this front set here. Sometimes that can make it difficult lining the radio up because in the past you'd line these two screws up and you'd know your radio was straight. With only top and bottom, you really have to pay attention to the front so you don't get the radio crooked or misaligned or something like that. The one other setback with doing a radio like this that has the spacer underneath it is that the screws that the radio comes with, these fine threads are typically not gonna be long enough to go through both of these pieces of plastic. For that, we actually stock a longer screw. These are M5 screws. Knowing we run into this a lot of times, we have these specifically for this. On these short chassis, I like to get at least two screws in, either the two tops or the two bottoms in similar areas. Don't tighten them up yet, just kind of get them in place. And then I can start to manipulate the front. The other thing too is like when you set it down like this, on a double din, you can set it and, and it, so now if you wanna do that, you do need a spacer of some kind to go underneath it to give it that height so that you can kind of work and get the kit all straightened out. Check your gapping. Once you get it all nice and straight, Tighten up all the screws. Tightening up the screws though can twist because it's plastic, it's kind of annoying. So even once you get them tight, do a second spot check just to make sure that everything is lined up and looking sexy. Radio replacement is becoming not as popular as it used to be. There's a lot of cars that have big dashes with there's no way you're putting a radio in it. But for the cars that you can still put a radio in, and this goes out to all you installers out there, take the time to make sure these things are straight in the dash. It's very important. After all, this is the one thing that they're going to look at, they being your customers, are gonna look at every day of the week. If it looks like crap, they're gonna assume the rest of the installation is also crap. The GPS antenna we talked about, we can put that up in that top dash area. It has some double-sided tape on the back of it that'll easily stick right up in there. We took the A-pillar off the car so that we could run the microphone. This will go up by the mirror. There's a little piece of tape on the back of it here. I like to add a second little piece of tape so that I can lock my wire into place. And then that USB-C cable, remove the Phillips screw, goes on the inside. Make sure that it's snug and tight. You can know it's snug and tight because when you put this metal piece back on, it will go back on. There's little teeth that go into holes to hold it in place. And that's the radio. Put my USB-C to regular USB back in the box. And the reason why I do that is so I know where it's at in the end. And if the customer needs it, we can just say, yeah, there's one in the box. And the last step before I forget is those two metal clips we had at the beginning. They go here and they go here. A bit of a side note on these two metal clips. These are a one and done style clip. You can try putting some glue on here to hold them in place. Not a bad idea. What's going to happen is they're going to go into the dash just once and then they're going to fall off when you go to pull it back out, which means you get to go hunting for them. So glue is a great idea. The other thing too is just be aware of that. So don't like test fit it with these on if you're worried about doing something like that. The nice thing is, is that the brackets are strong enough to hold it in place. These are really just there to finish it off. That leaves us with this guy here, which is the main wiring harness. Oh joy, bunch of, ah, lots of wires, lots of fun. There's a second part that we need, the other end of this. And that is going to be this guy here, which is the HRT01 for my data. Now you're probably thinking, how did I figure this out? Simply enough, I went to idatalink.com or maestro.com. It'll pull up a whole page where you can download their software, which you're gonna need to program this guy, which is the RR. The RR is the smart harness that's gonna talk to the car. It's gonna give us all the peripheral wires that we need to interface our car with. Those wires are this like pink wire here, which is VSS or vehicle speed sense. This tells the radio how fast it's moving. Reverse trigger if you're gonna do any form of backup camera. Emergency brake wire if you're one of the people that likes to hook that up. In some cases, the illumination wire is data controlled and we'll want our radio to dim when we turn on our lights. There could be some form of an amplifier in here or an amplified antenna that needs to be triggered to hook up this blue wire to or the blue white wire depending on your radio manufacturer. Kenwood is cool because they have a blue white for the amplifier and a blue for the amplified antenna. In some cases, we need an accessory wire. Car doesn't have one. The RR is going to provide that for us when it communicates with the vehicle. We have to tell this RR what type of car it's gonna go into, which is a Toyota. The other nice thing too is that it will also give you all the instructions on how to wire this up. However, there's an easier way because this 
is an HR harness, we can use this guy right here, which is a Ken 1. Ken 1 is this. And what this is, is the radio harness here, this one, connected to an iData harness. Pull this wire out. We'll set aside all the peripheral harnesses for now, because what we want to get to is this end here. These little guys are what plugs into the RR, and this guy here, this big plug, plugs into this harness like this, and then this plugs into our radio, and we're essentially done. Flash the module, plug this all in, figure out what our peripheral harnesses are, and we're all set. We don't even have to worry about soldering this thing or nothing. How cool is that? It streamlines this installation a ton, and that's how we're going to do it today. The only thing we need to do is program our RR2, this guy. Now inside the box for the RR2 is a small bag. Now, if you've opened them before, it had a whole bunch of stuff, we always just throw that away. They stopped doing that to try to conserve. Now we have four wires that are in there. The USB to program it. The If you're gonna be using this as a standalone radio, meaning it's not iData compatible, and you're just gonna be using this as a generic smart harness, you will need to be able to control the steering wheel wire, the blue-yellow, because they will not be connected via data. And then you have these two harnesses here. The one that has dual four pin connectors on it is the data to data harness. This is what you use if you're using an iData compatible radio. And this will talk to the radio and give you all the features into it. Your tire pressure, your steering wheel controls, and all the back end things that a factory radio would have are all done through this data to data port. Plugs into the little four pin here on the side. And then the last wiring harness is a communication three pin on one end and aux on the other. When you're doing the installation in the manual for it it will tell you if you need one or both of these it depends some you will some you won't that plugs into the brain right here and these correspond to these two inputs here on the back of the radio that aux jack plugs into this hole and the four pin plugs into that hole the peripheral harnesses that we have over here on the side the first one up is this RCA looking thing if this had a JBL system in it and we were retaining the JBL amplifier we'd be using this Next up is a OBD2 connection. Some Toyotas need this, some don't. It will tell us in the instruction manual. The premium audio plug, if this is JBL, we would need this. This would plug into the standard style Toyota adapter here and give us the premium input. We don't have that. Next are these two guys here. This yellow end denotes backup camera. The backup camera is not in the radio, therefore we know we're not gonna need these. And the last two here with these white ends are communication. We are going going to need one of these. The easiest way to do this is to just go look in the car. However, they do have these little flag tags on them that say C and B, which in the instructions will tell us which one we actually need. But I still like to just go into the car, plug it in real quick and find out, which I'm gonna do real fast. It's the small one. The small one is going to come over into this and there's a 10 pin connector, just like that. In this harness is a output for remote turn on. That camera plug would go here. So there are some extra wirings on here. One of the really nice things that forms out into this here, this beautiful Y. So we plug this in, this goes to the radio, and then this goes off to the RR. And this is so that it makes it easier to handle in tight dashes. We could spread these things out a lot which is cool. That's the theory behind this. It's gonna make our jobs a little quicker. We don't have to spend a lot of time on making this harness different, but we do have to flash it. Let's head over to the laptop, take a look at that process real quick. One of the cool things about their software, which I absolutely love, is that it's Mac compatible, which is the best in my world. They realize that there's more than one style computer out there, and well, we don't all use Windows. Go to the website, download the app, make an account, log into it. There's a reason why I do that. It makes it easier if you ever do have a problem. They have everything you've ever done on file and can look at what you did. Launch the software, flash by vehicle. This is a 2012 Toyota Tundra. With factory navigation and JBL, no. With factory navigation, without JBL, no. With JBL, without JBL. And then you can go over the steering wheel and see if this matches. In this case, it does. We have phone, we have that, we have the push to talk over here. In some cases, they'll have three and four different steering wheels. Just check them all out. Find the one that matches you. Go to the radio brand you have. Type in your model number, DMX908. 
S, and then they're gonna ask you for the serial number. This is a very important step. The serial number has to match the radio. It can be in three places. If it's a brand new radio, it's gonna be located here on the box. It can also be located on the top of the radio. It can also be located in the firmware section of the radio. The reason why I say that one is sometimes if you get a radio back from repair, they may have done a core exchange inside of the radio and the serial number no longer matches this, which means it will no longer match your RR, which means you have to go back in and reflash the RR to match the corresponding serial number. So you'd have to go into that feature on the radio and get it. The radio will power up so you can get to that information. It's just all the other features will not work. Enter that in. It tells you what the current firmware is. It asks you what harness you're going to use. It tells you your part number if you don't already know. You're going to have a K40 radar to this unit. Then it gets to select how you want to configure your system. We don't have a camera. We do not have a factory amplifier we are going to be using steering wheel controls it's telling us there is no USB media player advanced camera features if we were gonna add a camera we would want those and then vehicle information engages of course like so continue now if you're flashing this for a radio that is not compatible with RR you can still flash it and you can still do that it'll still give you steering wheel controls and all those fun things it just won't give you the stuff that the radio is going to talk to you about because it's not possible it's not going data to data but you can still use it as a smart harness follow that up with steering wheel configuration Steering wheel configuration, this is one of my favorite because it gives us that picture of the steering wheel control. The one thing I always shut off is on volume down. It's always mute and that's fine, but I like to switch it to none because when people get in there and they start pressing or holding or whatever, they want it to go down and it's muting and that drives people crazy. Push to talk is programmed. Select continue. This is the last page. This is telling you all the things that you've done. It gives you a recap of everything you've done. Select flash. Once the unit has flash, it's gonna pop up the next screen, which is gonna allow us to go and select the car's installation sheet. It is available right here. Tap the green arrow. Scroll down to the Toyota Tundra. With JBL. Without JBL. So in this case, we just have two choices with and without JBL. So it's gonna go over basic information about the unit and it's gonna get us to this page right here. This is the page we want. This is telling us everything we need to know about it. We can see that the OBD2 is plugged in right here. That means we're gonna have to run this guy and then it's telling us the harnesses we don't need and it's telling us that one connector that i plugged into the truck right there these two black lines here on the right are the smart wire and the aux to three pin it's telling us we need both of them we'll use them both and that's it. I like to save this just up in the background or drag it to my desktop so I can look at it periodically in case I forget or I get sidetracked or something like that. You can unplug it. You don't have to do anything special, hit anything. It's not going to blow the unit up or do bad things. Even though the harness is super cool and easy to plug and play, there are a couple things I like to do to modify the harness to better serve my needs. And that is, first off, I like to add in this guy here. This is a pigtail that comes off of the harness that adds in an accessory a constant 12 volts, a ground, and a remote turn on. You never know what they might add at some point down the road, a DSP, a dash cam, backup camera, who knows, but having these now already ready set, I don't have to tie back into this for any reason. For this installation, we're going to be using the radio to power the rear speakers, but we're gonna be using an amplifier to power the front speakers. So I've separated those speaker wires from this harness and they're sitting over here ready for my mid-range to get connected up to those. Every Everything else I just like to tape up so we have this fully non-rainbow looking harness so it looks very factory. I also zip tie my data wires into the harness itself so that I have a nice solid wrapped up harness that can go into the car and also tuck in to the dash nice and easy. I like this new look that iData is doing in their harnesses. I just want to put a little bit more tape on it. That's all. With the radio out of the dash. I would like to start on the driver door. It's a push clip in the top corner. Push a little bit. Kind of like I think pull it out. out. It jumped out at you, man. Yeah. It was like it was alive. I'm doing this right here. So put it in there. Grab your plastic tool. This one sometimes is three clips. Sometimes they stay in place. See, like this one. For that, I like to use the tool angle. You kind of like push it from one corner. And there we go. We put it back so we don't lose them. The next one we grab our pry tool, push it out. 
It's a regular Phillips screw. Right here on the handle, it's a carpet cover. Remove it, it's another Phillips screw. And then from there, some people, they just pop it out. I like to remove my switches because it's easy for me. The reason why I like to do it because this is kind of hard sometimes to remove it. Like if you see, you push it, but... So. It looked pretty easy, man. Yeah. <laughs> from there, you grab your pry tool and start from the bottom. Any corner, whatever you like. And look at that, now we're here. Oh, wow. Started at the bottom, now we're here. <laughs> remove your lock and your door handle. The white always goes in the top. Sometimes when you remove it, you don't pay attention. And when you put it back, it's like, oops. Sometimes clips stay in place. Grab our pry tool. As soon as we have it, we put it back in the door panel. Next step, push your speaker clip, remove it. You can use your Phillips screws. Sometimes it wobbles, so I like to switch it for a 10 millimeter. And that's it. Since we're here, let's take the speaker out of the dash. You can grab your flat pry tool. You can start in the corner, as you see. But because we're going to do a radio and we're gonna run our microphone, we're going to remove the A pillar. Same thing, grab your pry tool, two 10 millimeters. You grab it, there you go. Now grab your pry tool again. You got two 10 millimeters. Grab your ratchet. I always like to put my thumb on my finger on top of it so you don't scratch the windshield. Now you can join Dean on the bench so you can see what is going to replace these bad boys right here. These are the KFC XP6902Cs. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you hear us talking about these things all the time. Yes, they are that good, and yes, we do love them. And for those of you that have been watching the channel all that much, let's flip this over to the back, and we'll show you one of the cool features about these speakers. So they come with brackets that allow them to easily go into Toyotas, Chevys, Dodges, and basically anything that has a six by nine in it, because it's, well, now we can take a look at the speaker. Owner's manuals, instructions, all that fun stuff is all right here on top. Fast ring style foam. This is designed to go onto the front of the speaker so that when you put the door panel back on, it couples with the door panel and seals up the speaker against it so you don't lose any of that energy coming off of the six by nine. These are the two magical brackets. As you can see, it has all these lines and letters and on the back side, it shows you what to break off in order to match it up with your factory speaker. Open that up, it's down into this whole treasure trove of stuff. For some of the installations, you're just gonna need just like a regular spacer to move the speaker out. Here is the six by nine. It is shallow mount, but that does not diminish its base output. It has a really good mid base output. On the back, it has the passive crossover if you're going to be running this passively. If you're going to be hooking an amplifier up to it, let's say it has a bandpass crossover, which we're gonna be doing in this car, you have bypass, which means it'll bypass this crossover crossover that's on here. This also works if you're putting it in that Dodge that has the premium audio system that the system is already actively crossed over. You would connect this in bypass mode. The dash speaker that we're gonna put it in is this little guy right here, little two and a half inch. The crossover for it is this guy right here that easily clips onto the speaker wire and hooks up. And then there's just a ton of foam in this. For the back of the speakers, for the front of the speakers, anywhere you're gonna be putting it for the back of the plastic and the front of the plastic, little pieces of foam for going around the two and a half. There's speaker wire connectors that doesn't have a factory plug on it, but you can splice in and then it has the ends on it to hook up the six by nines in the doors. Comes with several different styles of screws. Everything is in this kit. Let's take a look at the little guys first. One of the nice things about this little guy is it has this pigtail here. And I love little pigtails like this, especially on a dash speaker, because as you saw us trying to get it out, it's very tight up there and trying to strip wires and do all that. If there is a connector, I've learned to love these going up into the dash. On this, it's easy enough. We can remove this. It's marked on the speaker. Red is positive, black is negative. So we don't have to polarity check it or anything like that. We can easily hook it up to our aftermarket. And when you sit the two on top of one another, the screw holes do line up. This is designed to drop right into place. And once we connect our wiring on here, we'll probably solder it. We'll be all set and ready to go. As far as construction differences, this one is made out of steel. This one is made out of composite. Magnet wise 
Our new one is clearly bigger. Depth wise, which is important, and this is something that Ken would spend a lot of time on trying to get right, is that they're very similar in depth. And the reason for that is that a lot of the times your air conditioning ductwork is what sits right underneath there. And if you have something that's super deep, well, it's it's not gonna sit flat. Most two and a halfs, for some reason, they put this on there. It's a UV protectant, I'm sure. They've done the same thing on this. So if you're looking through that top grill, it'll have a similar look and feel to it. As far as our factory speaker, that's that UV I was talking about. You can actually see the factory grill ghosted into the speaker. That's pretty crazy, right? Back side of it, little tiny Neo magnet. These things get hot. So if you're doing one of these right after it's been blaring, be careful on this. And we have seen where this has actually gotten so hot, it's fallen off of this mount. This is some kind of composite. There's foam all the way around it. This foam here on the front is what this is designed to help replicate. And it will close that gap that is on there from the factory. This is kind of deep when compared to this, because this is universal, it's gotta fit in a bunch of stuff. The foam is what's designed to fill that in. This has this weird shape to it. And if you kind of look at this, you can kind of see where the two have corresponding holes. This is how I usually like to do it. I just kind of put one on top of one another and fill it out, or I just go put it on the door and figure out what I need to break off or sand off or whatever it is. You can use pliers. I like to use a grinder and just get it really nice. Be careful with an X-Acto knife. It is actually thicker and harder than it looks and you don't want to cut your finger off. Now, when comparing the two drivers, these have a cloth surround. This has a foam surround. This is some form of a plastic style cone. Clearly, this is a paper. Big regular style magnet as opposed to this little guy here. Metal construction as opposed to composite construction. As far as depth for the two go, this is gonna sit a lot lower because it's there's no big magnet on the back and a lot of it comes out. If you put it in here and compare the heights to one another, you can see it's not that far off. And as far as depth goes, the depth is no deeper than this trim bezel here. So you're not gonna have any issues with it going in and hitting the window or window bars or something like that. And you can see why just putting this simple piece of foam on here will get it to the right depth out to attach to, if you'll notice this little line right here, there's actually a trim on the factory that this will go into. And so we'll be able to retain all that, which is really nice. When prepping the bracket to match the factory, I like to start with a pair of duckbills. And the first thing in a Toyota is removing these two areas here. These are GM mounts and they need to come off. Just grabbing them and rocking them back and forth will easily remove them. The reason why I like to remove them is because the next step is me setting this on the door panel and just kind of getting an idea of what holes are which. You can do this, but it's just eyeballing it and, oh yeah, those look close, but I like to just double check. Definitely gonna be these four corners. I need to remove this guy over here some of this and just kind of like round these out. Now I switch to this guy, a little bit better job. Test fit it one more time. Need to remove this one piece here cause it's kind of getting in the way of this wiring. This hole here, this hole over here means I can remove these two pieces. So I've made some modifications to this just to line it up better in my mind. Let's go back over to the bench and finish it up. Grab my bag of foam, apply it to the front of the speaker bracket, and then apply it to the back of the speaker bracket. There, we have it all foamed up. This will screw in like this once we get to that point. Let's go get this over into the door. Make sure our foam is actually on the metal and not just like floating somewhere. And that's good. We can test that with our hands. And this is what we end up with, our factory speaker bracket. There is a notch right here for a wire to come through just like that. For the dash speakers, even though we could use that plug, we're not going to because we're not actually going to be using the factory wire for the dash speakers. We're gonna go active. So the four channel amp that we're gonna put in here, two of the channels are gonna power the mid base. The other two channels are gonna power the two and a half up in the dash. This way we can get maximum power to the front of the vehicle and total control. That amplifier has a bandpass crossover in it that will explain how that all works when we get to the amplifier. But this will allow us to really focus the power to the front of the vehicle. And the radio is more than enough to power a set of coaxial six and a half in the back. And there you have it with the speaker now in place. The foam is on the front. This is ready to get the door panel back on. That wire goes through that little notch. He's taped it up so that it looks factory. That piece I was talking about that this is going to couple with is this little line right here, 
we want that 6x9 to just come right up and direct all its sound through this grill. If the sound doesn't do that, you can waste some of the energy and lose some of the cool mid bass, which we don't want to do, right? Because that's why we're going with these cool aftermarket speakers. Sadly, I can't tell you how many times we get cars in, 911s and services and like that, where they put really expensive mid bass in the door and there's like a gap like this big between the front of the speaker and the door panel and all that is just causing the door panel to rattle and buzz. If you don't want your door panel to rattle and buzz, make sure it couples somehow, some way with that door panel. Let's take a look at what is going into the rear of the vehicle. Moving on to the rear door, what do we have, Fernando? The rear door is similar as the front door, has the same screws, same clips. The only difference is in this part right here, this one actually is missing. Different clips, but same idea. So that's like the sail panel. Correct. That okay. piece right there. So we're gonna go clip right there, remove your carpet, grab your pry tool. This one actually has bigger clips. And then from there, door switches as you see pull it out put it up white clip in the top green and your door panel is out unplug your speaker bracket same screws 310 millimeters and your speaker is out all right let's go take a look at these and what we're going to replace them with for rear speakers we're going to do these guys right here they are the kfc dash x one seven four six and a half inch coaxial speakers flipping the box over and looking at the back similar to the bracket that comes with our six by nines this does come with a somewhat universal six and a half inch mount they show you it here for gm chrysler it is also just if you break off all these tabs a quarter inch spacer however the one thing it will not work in is a toyota for that you will need a bracket this guy here to emulate the factory speaker mounts this is the six and a half it has a butyl rubber surround it has that same comb material that the front 6x9 has has a giant silk soft dome tweeter located right here that's why it has these over the top of them to protect you from putting your finger in there and smashing it down i know people want to do that giant magnet on the back but let's compare this to the factory speaker and what we're taking out of the car similar to the front speaker it has this little tiny neo magnet composite basket this one has a cloth surround paper cone that foam to match up to the door panel it's really not an impressive speaker at all this is what we're going to be putting in comparing the two the bracket brings the speaker out to about the same so just a little piece of foam on this is all you're going to need to get it in there depth wise is the exact depth as the factory you can see from the back very monster very big this speaker something else about this because it's unique is it is bi -ampable. if you wanted to run a four channel amp to this you could the tweeter wire runs through this piece right here you can remove this foam easily get to it the capacitor for the tweeter is located right here so you could remove these two wires and make this bi -amped if you want bi -amp simply just means instead of using the passive cross over on it you go to a outboard four channel amplifier and use it to power the whole speaker let's get this over to the car and fernando can finish it up what he's done to this to prep it is we've put foam here on the back it does not come with that you will need it and then foam on the front if you're looking to figure out what foam you need if you head over to dnf tool drawer that's dnf tool drawer.com you can find foam and also a lot of the tools that we use in these videos to do the installation and the first of the rear speakers is done we added the foam like we talked about Bracket mounted in place, attached, that's it. Ready to put the door panel back on? Yes, sir. Green on the bottom, white on top. So that is done. Start with sliding it in from the top first. Sometimes in this corner right here, the clips, as you see, this one kind of like pops out. Make sure it's in. Put your screws in and done. For the dash speakers, because they're active, we have to run our own wires to them. What we like to do is make a cool twisted pair and cover it in braided loom and bring it into the dash. In this case, it's a mid-range, so we're gonna use blue. And we have a white with blue, which is the drivers, and a gray with blue, which is the passenger. You all set and ready to go? Yes. So we use insulated female ends. There's a small and a large as far as the size go to denote positive and negative. Negative is the smaller one. We also add the foam and the bottom that comes with the Kenwood kit. Put the screws back in just like you did when you took them out. We mount our amplifier, we don't know where yet. Four wires will come up in the dash. Two for the mid base, 
two for the mid-range. For the subwoofer, we're going to be going with this guy right here. This is one of Fernando's favorites. This is the Rockford P300 8-inch amplified subwoofer. Over here on the side, it has the amplifier and it also has this, the port. This thing puts out a tremendous amount of bass like all the P300 styles do. The nice thing is though, it is very compact. As you can see, this is only four and seven eighths of an inch deep by 17 and three quarters. Height is 11 and a half. We needed this to go in a very specific place. He wants to keep his toolbox in the back of his car and oddly enough, this fit perfect in there and is low enough the seat doesn't even come close to it. Even though this is taking up a portion of the room, he'll still have the whole other half to put other tools and stuff like that in. We do have to leave the top off, of course, but hey, it's, it's what it is. The nice thing is, is he'll be able to remove this out of the box, take the box out if he needs to, take this out if he needs more space. The other nice thing about this is all these plugs are designed to come out and we make a really nice harness with braided loom that allows this to be removable. It also has a base knob, this guy right here. Here. This base knob is kind of big and it can be mounted up underneath the dash. It comes with a piece. A lot of times that's where it ends up going. However, if you do want to make a custom mount on this, you could squeeze this. This will pop apart. You will need the screw for this because it doesn't come with it. And it is this wide. So there is some sanding that you can do to the circuit board. We don't know where we're going to mount it yet. If we do all that, I'll show you. Otherwise, it's just going to get mounted up underneath the dash. And then in this parts bag, it does come with some Velcro to attach it down. The base knob wire, it's just a really long three pin aux cable. It comes with an Allen key, two extra fuses, and this guy right here, which is your high level or low level plug. It has a set of RCAs on it, or you can cut it and connect it via high level. What we like to do on this is even though you can just plug a set of RCAs into here, we're not going to, we're gonna cut this off and solder our own wiring onto this, and we will solder RCAs onto it behind the radio. That way we can make them as long as we want, and also we don't have this big bulky connector right here, which is totally not necessary. Last is the power plug and with these three plugs plugged into it they can come out so you can make this removable serviceable whatever you need it to be the one nice thing about this enclosure is all the enclosures use the exact same harness with the exact same style of amplifier what that means is that if you put this in and he decides he wants more bass we can easily swap it out for a bigger sub however he will have to lose his tray however that's something else to think about down the road power wire we like to use an 8 gauge both power and and ground. For wiring up the P300, we have a whole process for doing it. We do a lot of them. First off is get the run of power wire that you need. In this case, probably about 15 feet is about what we're going to be using. Put an 8 gauge ferrule on it. And I put about 5 or 6 inches of red heat shrink over the end of it. I repeat the process on the ground wire. In this case, we have about five feet of ground wire. And I repeat the process on the remote turn-on wire. We always run a remote turn-on wire with our P300, whether it's going high level or low level. One of the cool things a remote turn-on has three choices. It has DC offset, audio sense, as well as 12 volt. I need two short pieces of eighth inch braided loom. Get about a 12 inch piece, cut it in half. One of those goes over the end of the base knob, just like that. And then you need about an inch and a half, three eighths heat shrink. Cut off the RCA ends. My other piece of eighth inch is gonna go over wire I'm running to the front. Quarter inch piece of heat shrink. Put it over my wire so it's, it's like that. I'm gonna solder these two wires together. With that soldered up, slide the loom over and under this piece of heat shrink. And there again, the heat shrink, the heat shrink is only there to finish the end. Leave a little bit exposed, shrink it up. I put tape over my loose end here just to finish it off because the next step it is gonna be helpful on. And that is the big sleeve that makes it all one big bundle. Typically I'll make this about two inches, three inches shorter than what my ground wire is, minus this lead. Typically from here till about that much off of the end is what this loom is going to be. With all the ends in your hand, I like to start with my aux, then my little four pin, and then that follows up with the power wires. And if I do this right, I don't need to tape them all together. They'll just move as that solid bundle all the way through this braided loom. This is three quarters of an inch 
braided loom. And when I get to the end, kind of work them out gently. So they come out of the hole, put the loom down a little bit. Next, take a big one inch piece of shrink wrap, same thing, aux, then the four, then your power wire goes through. Once that's done, grab the power plug and attach that to our wiring. Bring back the subwoofer enclosure and plug everything in. At this point, what you need to do is kind of work the wiring and your braided loom until you get the right amount of bend. To do that, you just balloon up the braided loom until you get it where you want it and the wires are tight or loose. This is why having tape on the end of these makes them easier to slide in and out through this. Once you have it exactly where you want it, heat up your shrink wrap. This is gonna sit just like this in the car and make it easy to take in and out. Stread back out your braided loom. It doesn't have to be super tight. A little bit of looseness is pretty good. You want it to be flexible. Once you get that done, come to your end point here. And just like you did for the thin stuff, put some tape on there just to basically finish it off and tie it into place. At this point, I'll be separating out the ground and I still have these wires. So for the run from where this ends, which is right about where the C pillar starts all the way up to the kick panel. I'm gonna cover this in half inch braided loom. And then at that point, I'll stop, I'll pull out the remote turn on, the base knob and the speaker wire, and the rest will get covered in an even smaller loom to go out underneath the hood. That's the process for building this. Let's get this into the car and I'll show you how we're gonna run the wiring. The tray for the subwoofer is located right here. You can see these ridges. It's this guy right here, and this is where the subwoofer is gonna go. Our wiring needs to come come to about here, and then it's gonna run and loop across, and then it'll enter into the car for the floor sill to come right up and along here. And this truck, it has these little pop-up areas that come up so that we can tuck our wiring into it, and then the rest of the wiring is gonna come behind this seat pillar here. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you can get to this area by pulling up the carpet, tucking it in underneath it. Other times, you do need to remove this seat belt and remove the whole seat pillar. We'll see how this one fares out. There's a channel up under here that we can fish the wire through. Here's the rest of that. It'll come through these and then into the kick and then the base knob will probably go somewhere in this area and the rest of the wire will go out to underneath the hood. Let's take a look at that wiring ran in the back. Ground is in place, wire is ran. What we ended up doing is right here where the seat belts are, bring our wire out. It gets run underneath the carpet, brought into place. This is comes back up. locks down, remove the B-pillar, zip tie the wire up into place, and then it got tucked into the factory. It now is just waiting for its final road home, which is gonna be into the engine bay, probably into one of these two knockouts, and of course, up into the dash. We could still use this full area here, has the tool tray, but our subwoofer is going to sit right here. As we saw, this is removable. The sub box is removable. Everything about this is removable so he can do whatever he would like with it. And the seat closes plenty of room for the subwoofer to breathe. Well, there's not a lot of choices as far as installation goes. It could go in there, but I really don't wanna do that. Underneath this seat, there is plenty of room. We are gonna make a bracket system. It's gonna come off of the back two seat bolts here, mount it right there, and then both power wires can easily come out here to the battery. To do that, we do need to take some measurements. I have a pad of paper and a pen. Well, the one secret to, to designing amp racks that go underneath the seat is to try not to over complicate it that's for sure. And also don't make it as basic as humanly possible. We need screw down points because we need something that's gonna hold this in place. We're gonna go between these two seat bolts here, which means the widest I'm gonna need this is 19 and a half. What I like to do on the pad of paper is draw what I think is gonna be my basic shape first. We 
which is gonna look something like this. There's gonna be a taper on the passenger side, just the way it comes in just a little bit. There's some hump there in the way, and then there'll be a taper on this side. We need to add those in. And then we also need to figure out how far back the cut in needs to be, which is where I'm gonna start. So that looks like six inches in. And then we have two inches for the pieces that are going underneath the seat. I'm gonna make this 16 inches, so it's gonna be 19 and a half by 16 inches. So that's three inches. Yeah, just change that to four inches and then we'll taper it in. That is gonna seven inches. All right, so I've come up with this weird design here. I'm just gonna cut it out and we'll take a look at it. Here's the bracket from the back side underneath these two rear arms of the seat. There's these giant washers that, or risers I should say, that are underneath this seat. So if we look at how big these holes are, the seat is actually still touching the ground. The material that this is made out of is sitting around the outside of that washer and it's just barely lifted up. So once we tighten the seat down, it'll actually compress the material. There's still a gap here so that vent can blow up underneath. And the ample sit just like that. So looking at it, tapers in to avoid all of this area, which we don't need. It's sitting crooked right now because the seat pulled it back when it flips up. But this will be the working area that we have for the amplifier. Now for the fun part, which we'll is get it back over to here on the bench. Let's wire this thing up. Let's take a look at the power that is going to be going into this for our front stage. This is the XR401-4, four channel, Kenwood Exelon reference series amplifier. What does that mean? This is the best that Kenwood makes. High res audio, we're gonna have a high res audio deck. It's just as, this is it. This is their flagships. Taking a look at the back side, has some of the information on it that we all know and love. 75 watts by four, 100 watts by four, two ohm. You can bridge this, you get 200 watts by two. It does come with a bass knob. Has speaker level input along with signal sense. We'll be using RCAs. Size wise, this thing is tiny. Eight and 11 sixteenths by six and five eighths by one and three eighths tall, skinny. When we first open it up, we have a couple Allen keys, some screws and a nut for the base knob. This is the base knob here. We're not gonna be using this because we're not using it as a sub amplifier. And here we have the amplifier. The screws for the power wire are covered underneath this little guy right here. Down inside are Allen screws. That's why it comes with the long Allen wrenches in the box. I like to put my screws back into the top of the amplifier until I'm done. That way I don't lose them. As far as this little panel here, I'll also go put this back in the box for the meantime. Taking a look at the side of the amplifier that has all our inputs on it. You have channels A, channels B, which is basically front and rear, or in this case, dash and door. 30 amps of current draw, power, remote, ground. Left positive, negative. Right negative, then positive. Bridged is left positive right negative. Channel B goes the exact same way. Flipping it over onto the back side. There's tons of switches and dials on the sides of the amplifier to do a ton of different things. First off, input selection. You have A, B, and A. Because we're gonna be using this amplifier to power the whole front stage, we only need one RCA in, which is A. So we can select A. We have our two gain controls, both A and B. In this case, A is gonna be the dash speaker. B is going to be the six by nines in the door. We have filters low pass, off, and high pass, and low pass, off, and high pass for B. The remote level control will plug in here, and that's on channel B if you decide you wanna use half of this to power the subwoofer. The next set of switches are frequency range, low and high. 
Sometimes on the show we talk about a 10 time multiplier switch is what you need in order to do a tweeter. This has it and they just call it low or high. Low is gonna be standard. High is gonna be a 10 time multiplier switch, which is gonna take the standard dial from 50 to 200 from 2.5K to 10K. Now, when you select that on channel B and you select low pass, what it'll do is it'll create a low pass crossover that can now be from 2.5 to 10K. So if you're gonna do like a set of tweeters on channel A, you can do a set of mid on channel B and you can dial in that crossover point that you're looking for in the middle. And then you would use your radio's 80 Hertz high pass crossover to be the bottom for that mid range. Allows you to do a lot of adjustability between the two. It's kind of cool. The amplifier is screwed into place. That's how it's gonna sit, back of the car, front of the car. I've prepped the wiring that I need for this. I have a set of six foot RCAs that are plugged in. They are plugged into A because that is the only input we're gonna need to feed the two outputs for dash and door. I'm gonna turn on wire first. The mid range and the dash, we're gonna use the blue stripe wire for. We're doing speakers, we have a color code. If it's the standard color, gray, white, Green, purple are always gonna be the same, but the second color, which is the ground, will change depending on what it is we're doing. Black is always a mid base and or that color for that channel specifically. Blue or brown is a mid range, and then yellow, orange, or red could be a tweeter. Door speakers are in. Moving on to the ground. The last connection will be the positive. That is the wiring that needs to go in the amplifier. Now it needs to turn directions and kind of go places. What I mean by that is these wires here have to go this way and these wires here can just journey on straight. This is going to turn and go up into the center console that's located right here. These are gonna come straight and go into a hole in the carpet that's there. These are gonna turn like this in behind that carpet. I just need to drill some holes so I can tie the wire into place. And then we'll be using the wire ruler to make our holes. With those made, I like to use four inch zip ties. Now I have multiple layers of holes that I just drilled. So I wanna make sure that my little nub here is towards this way or towards that way. So I can keep the hole free for the next one. And with all the zip ties in place, our wiring is all tucked in the direction it needs to go. I've also taped up all the signal wiring so that it's safe and secure up into the dash, the whole cable. And our power and ground are zip tied down into place. I've replaced the cover over the screw holes. The only step now is to, well, let's get it into the car. With the wires ran, this is the end result. Let me explain how it went down. We talked about the wire coming through this hole here, through the track here, similar to the P300 from the back. My ground point is right here. There was already a threaded hole. It took an M6, took the posi ground brush, cleaned off the hole, added their star washer, put a screw in place, ground's taken care of. All my signal wires ran up. There's a big air conditioning duct right here that they tuck in through, come in behind into the dash, and everything gets executed inside of this hole. The base knob for the P300 ended up right here on this knockout. And then the last step in this equation is getting the power connected. Let's take a look at Fernando's fancy fuse holder. So it attaches here with a screw and then this bracket will come off, but each one of these fuses, these are the Stinger fuses, these will disconnect from their mounts and are easily removable. So you can remove the whole bracket without actually removing the fuse holders if you need to. He's also labeled the fuse holders, what they go to both on the input and output, just in case someone were to take these apart, they could get the right fuses into their spots. The wires come up along the side here and go into a grommet in the firewall right next to the brake booster there. The last step will be connecting both of these up to the positive terminal here. And it's that time to get the radio installed into the dash. I like to start with my loosest cables first, so the longest ones start out. And also, while you're putting it in, try not to get wires all tangled up. A bloody mess. Uh, earlier, 
when we took the dash part, we talked about how sometimes we remove the loom that's on here and separate the harness and retape it. I ended up doing that mainly because the antenna wire is up in that and it makes it very hard to plug into the radio if it's in that bundle. Now those wonderful clips will pop off. So this is like a one shot deal. That means I am not going to snap this into place yet. I want to turn it on and do some checking first. Make sure everything is doing what it's supposed to do. Make sure you take the time and go through the setup page. It's very important. It'll save you time in the end. CarPlay comes up. Means our USB is working. Check the steering wheel controls. What's the weather like today? Expect some clear skies today. Daytime temperatures will hover we around two degrees with overnight lows around play some pink noise we can hear the subwoofer playing in the background turn the subwoofer volume down all right that turns down menu audio we have a mid bass yep both speakers on my side four is working three is working Good center Turn this down, go back, go into my crossovers. Rear is a six and a half, front is a six by nine. It has a large, we're just gonna call it a large format tweeter. Lower doors on both, subwoofer is an eight inch. Now we'll go into the actual crossovers. Rear, I'm gonna turn those down because they're not amps and they're using deck power. When you use deck power, the deck power will seem hotter. It's on a different volume curve. So from zero to all the way up is different on deck power than it is on the preamp. So it's easier just to gain it down. If we need more gain, we can always come back. Fronts, turn on their crossover. Everything looks good there. Subwoofer, it has a crossover in the box, but we'll just leave it at 80 Hertz. EQ right now is set to flat. Sound effects are all turned off. Knowing that everything is where it's supposed to be, the next test we want to do is polarity. So we'll grab our PT9A Plus that we get from Mobile Solutions, and we will play some polarity pops. The track we use, Sheffield Labs, my disc, Polarity Pulse. Sounds a little something like this. What are you getting? Green. 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 I uh, get green on the rear door. That means all our speakers are moving positively or out this way. If they were moving red, they'd be moving down. It wouldn't matter. We just want them all to play in the same direction, which is key, and it's doing that. So now we go through the mental checklist on our head. Fernando, we've tested. The steering wheel control, yes. it works. We've tested the microphone, it works. We're plugged into the USB, it's working. Balance of faders operating properly. Polarity speakers are moving the way they're supposed to, or the way we want them to, I should say. This does not have a backup camera built into the radio, so we don't need to do any testing for that. That means that at this point, we can snap this all back together, put our four 10 millimeter screws in, and then we will proceed to start level matching, equalizing, which you'll see right now. All right, so let's go over our goal as far as how we're wanting this to sound. One, dynamic, full, all that. That's a gimme, we want it to do all that. Four channel amplifier, powering the front. That gives us independent level control between the two and a half and the six by nine. Six and a half in the rear, powered off the radio. The radio gives us, through the crossover section, fine tuned control there. What we wanna do is balance the top of the dash between the mid bass first, and then we bring in the rear. To do that, I have Fernando sit in the front seat. I figure out my crossover points and my gains because they're back here and he sits here and lets me know if the blending is working. If you use a distortion detector and you're maxing out the input level control on the amplifier, which is more than likely what you're gonna do, that is telling you how loud you can play it. You're not gonna wanna play the two and a halfs and the six binders at the same level. You're gonna wanna bring those two and a halfs down so that they blend with the bigger driver. Once you've done that, now it's I'll hop into the passenger seat and 
went to the crossover page and started to bring up my rear until he could just barely hear the rear. And that gives us what we're looking for as far as level matching goes. So that's how that was done. We've already done that. Next is just to do an overall EQ and kind of see if our level matching is working well with our EQ. Right now, everything is pretty balanced, but it's flat. We want to take care of any problems that are in here or just see if we can make it sound a little better. To do that, I have my eye test mic on my iPad running the Studio 6 RTA software. I'm gonna set it right here on the dash. I already have the EQ loaded. I'm gonna play pink noise. So I'm gonna start talking and it's gonna change some, but as you saw before that, that was just staying put, which is what we want while we're trying to adjust the EQ. If it's active like this, it makes it very hard to figure out what is the noise and where is it coming from. Once I have a starting point, so to speak, I'm gonna put it in memory. I'm also gonna apply it to all sources just in case something else goes weird. I can always go to a different source and grab this. Now it's time to switch to some regular music that I know, and that's the key. You wanna play music that you know and make sure that you like the way it sounds. Spent some time. Fernando's been in and out as you see, sitting here waiting patiently. Uh, what'd you think, Fernando? I like it. That sounds good. Yeah, it's yeah. not bad. It's very nice. Yeah. It's got a good front sound stage to it. Lots of power, sounding good. We got a good amount of bass in there. In that box, your favorite, by the way, the little eight-inch yes, amplified. Yes, I love that box. Yes. That's pretty cool. And it fit in there so snug. I mean, look at it. How adorable is it? Oh, so adorable. As they say, I love it when a plan comes together. This plan came together. Mr. Hannibal. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. The good Hannibal. I don't know. I guess it's just all a matter of perspective. Right? Anyways, we hope he enjoys it as much as we enjoyed putting it in for him. And with that, we're going to end it here. We hope you guys enjoyed it. Fernando. On to the next one, guys. You guys have a great night as always. We'll see you later next time. Bye. Bye. So long. Farewell. Get out of here. We got to put the floor mats back in and yeah, deliver it. Exactly. And then work on something else. Yay.